Thank you, for everybody, for joining in tonight. It's very much appreciated, and I appreciate the invitation to talk to you tonight about the history of the Dunmore East Lifeboat and the book that we produced recently last year to uh, retain that history because it was very close to being lost. So that was the reason why the book came out. So without further ado, we'll. I'll tell you a little bit about Dauntless Courage and Don Murray's life. So uh, you might wonder why somebody living in Bootsistan in Dublin would be able to write about Don Murray's. Well, I was brought up in Don Murray's in the 1950s and 1960s. And that's me there in almost 70 years ago with my father in Don Murray's where he was a harbour master. So it was very difficult for me not to have a little bit of salt, salt water in, in my veins. That's where we lived. That was the harbour as it was in the 50s and 60s before the, it was re redeveloped for become a major fishery port. And that was uh, the view I walked up, up to every morning, every every summer, which is, you can see, is a wonderful view. And in the middle of the harbour, you can see the, the lifeboat of that beer at the Annie Blanche Schmidt on, on her moorings. And then during the winter, everything changed because it, was, it became a fishing port. And that's that mid-1950s, about 1956. And if you look at the end of the pier, you see the house where I, I live, so you can see how close I came to the sea. And it's really no surprise that I became interested in, in lifeboats from a very early age. And there's another connection I had with lifeboats. That's uh, in the Maritime Museum in Dunleary, and that's a model of the last Kingstown rowing uh, and sailing lifeboat called the Dunleary 2. And that model was made by my Uncle Jim Carroll, who was the first curator of the museum. Mm -hmm. So that's another connection I have. So, so how did I connect back to Dunmore? Well, the re this is quite simple. This gentleman here, he's looking in tonight. Uh, I know Andrew Doherty. Andrew is a, a wonderful person. He's a, a blogger, a writer a guide of heritage walks, a historian, a community activist. Everything is good, good about his, his community and his, uh, his area. So um, Andrew was writing a weekly, this is about five years ago, Andrew was writing a weekly blog on Waterford Harbour and I became an avid reader every Friday morning, waited couldn't wait to re read what he'd written. I got, got really interested and started to communicate. And slowly but surely, uh, Andrew then invited me, to, would I like to submit something, which I did. And he liked it and posted it and then asked me, would I do another one? And I remember first um, response, oh, don't think so, but anyway, I did. And I never looked back and he's encouraged me and I started writing on it not as difficult as I had imagined and really interesting researching and looking up newspapers and just found it so enjoyable and, and, and pleasant that it continued and then we that just tells you a little bit about Andrew as a writer he's written two books the first one before the tide went out that was a bestseller sold out twice so it's no longer available but his latest book Waterford Harbour Tides and Tales is still available and make a lovely present for anybody looking for a, a nice book to buy for somebody interested in maritime matters for, for Christmas or whenever. So there's no hesitation in, in giving Andrew a plug. So one of the things I plan to write for Andrew is about the feathered lifeboat disaster of 1914. And to that end, I sought out the help of this person here. And this is Brendan Dunn, a volunteer in the lifeboat in Dunmore East for over 36 years. And, and very much like Andrew, very passionate about history and heritage of, of his own community. And um, Brendan very kindly got permission to get me all the archival material on the feathered lifeboat disaster from the point of view of the Dunmore East lifeboat, which took part, and we'll come back to that later in the in the talk. But Brendan was quite concerned at the time that the history of the, the lifeboat in Dunmore East could, could very well become lost because the demographics of the village were sort of changing rapidly. And 
was no longer really a, a fishing village. Um, was going in a different direction and he was felt it should be recorded because if, if it wasn't done, you could no longer re rely on families passing on the stories. So he was really keen and he asked me would I be interested and of course the first reaction was, oh, I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be sort of good enough. But anyway, we chatted and at the end of the day, I agreed. And it was the best decision I ever made because I had two really enjoyable years researching and writing about the book and communicating with other people in Dunmore East and further. And the response we got from everybody was wonderful. People donated photographs and, and a lot of those now you see tonight in the images in the slides. So I'm sure the people who gave us permission to use them in the book won't, won't mind us sharing them here, here tonight. So work on the book started and um, about a year or so later, um, we're getting near the end of the, the process and that's a visit Brendan and myself made to Poole and Dorset and we went to the RNI archives and we got to see records and photographs from Don Maurice that we didn't know existed. So it was really a worthwhile visit and it really gave us a a great Philip to, to go ahead with the book. Up to that stage, we thought we'd be bringing out maybe a small booklet, a little heritage booklet, and relying on um, a grant here and there to reduce it. And if they didn't come when the book would sort of go on hold, but we got great encouragement in Poole. And back then in Don Murray's, Bill, Bill Devey, who was a lifeboat volunteer, was, um, encouraged us like. Forget about looking for grants, go and go commercially, look for sponsorship from the community, which I thought would be very difficult in the, the COVID era, but it wasn't to be. We got a wonderful response from local businesses and uh, business community and individuals, and it was wonderful because that mess, met the cost of producing the book. And this is a committee that Brendan put in place to get the book promoted and uh, publicized and they were really hard working great group of people and it really worked hard together took the orders packaged the books when they arrived got them into the post stayed up late posting and getting all the orders in and making it a, a wonderful success so thanks to all those people for their involvement because it wasn't something that one person could do on its own it was a team effort so there's the committee and uh, the Bill's company there's just hidden DVD print and graphic solutions and water. They did, did a wonderful job in the book, so very great. And that's just a little bit about the book. Um, the name, for a long while we hadn't got a name and I was starting to almost start to panic. And lo and behold, I saw um, a newspaper cutting from 1936. And in it, these two words came up, as it says there, the men who face such a gale must have had dauntless courage. Bingo, that was, that was the title of our book. And uh, in the history of the Don Marie's lifeboat since 1884, only one crew member has ever been lost. And his name was Philip Boucher, and he was lost in Waterford Harbour in 1893. And uh, we dedicated the book uh, to Philip. We'll come back to that again shortly. So, for the cover of the book, um, a number of people said, Oh, you know, the new current life book, which is the Elizabeth and Ronald, you know, this wonderful photographs of it heading out in heavy seas. And, you know, that's, but um, Brendan and myself are very keen on something historical, and this is the one we. Picked and I think we made a good choice. It's the um, from 1941. Um, <laughs> the, the Irish Willow, now the Irish Willow wasn't being rescued, but it had rescued 47 survivors from a ship that had been uh, torpedoed in uh, the mid Atlantic called the Empire Breeze. And the survivors. Irish Willow was on its way to Waterford Harbour, so at, as it rounded a hook, 
head on the estuary to Waterford, um, the Dunmore lifeboat met them, and the survivors were taken on board and brought to Dunmore East, where they were attended to by the first Red Cross and so on, and then repatriated back to the UK. So we mention that again in the book. And this is the 25th of November 2021. So this night, exactly one year ago, we launched the book book online. Couldn't have a um, one in person, but we did, we did it online and it was very enjoyable and still available online for anybody who wants to watch. And the person who introduced the, the book, that's Jeff Harris from the local radio station in Waterford who would be from a family very supportive of the lifeboat always and sailing. And he introduced us on the night and then we had a panel and it was hosted by Damien Tiernan, who a lot of you may remember, who used to be the Southeast correspondent for RTE and now works in local radio in Waterford. And then it was myself, Brendan Dunn, the volunteer of 36 years and the person who Got behind the book, and then we had Neville Murphy, who a lifeboat volunteer and also a member of the R117 helicopter to rescue uh, helicopter based at Waterford Airport. And um, as you'll see in the slides, Neville is a wonderful photographer, so do some wonderful over the last 20 years or so, some wonderful photographs of the of the lifeboat and we were delighted to use so many in, in the book. And 25th of November is another significant date because in 1970 there was a famous rescue when um, and we'll come to that in, in the story. So and that's sort of the end of the end of the road there the um one proceeds from the book were raised over 31,000 and then last August it was handed over to the RMLI. So it was a great, great occasion and everybody was delighted. So get back to the book itself now. Uh, sorry. Yes, that's for anybody, sorry. Anybody who is not very familiar with Dunmore East, there may be some people watching. It's at the entrance to Waterford Harbour at the beginning of the estuary on the Waterford hand, Waterford side of the estuary. The far side is County Wexford. And it's some famous headlands there, Hookhead, which has the second oldest operational lighthouse in the world. So it's a magnificent place, rather treacherous, not a place you'd want to um, go ashore there and close by his bag and bun. Back in Bunhead, where the um, the Normans first landed in Ireland, and then you might see the Kirok Islands, which we'll come to in the story, and down on the Waterford coast, and you Grand Head, Oscar Rock, which is a, a notorious rock close to Dunmore East, and then up the harbour, Broom Hill, where there's a a famous shipwreck, which we'll talk about, and further up. Passage East Ballyhack, where the ferry is. And further up, you can't see it as Cheek Point, where Andrew is based. So, at the start of the book, what I did, I drew two rescues, or 106 years apart. And the one at the bottom of your screen, the rescue of the marooned. Five feathered lifeboat men. Nine were lost, but five survived, and they got ashore on the rocks at the Kirok Islands, along with eight survivors from the uh, school in the Norwegian schooner, the Mexico. So they were on the rocks for three days until they were rescued. And there was three lifeboats involved: it was the Dunmore East lifeboat, the Rossler Fort lifeboat, as it was then, and the Kilmore Key lifeboat. And we talk about that story shortly. But 106 years later, just in October 2020, the same three lifeboats went to rescue this modern day cargo ship, the Lily B, which was 
very close to going onto the rocks at Hook Head, which would have been, apart from the possible loss of life, would have been a disaster ecologically for the Hook Peninsula and the wildlife and so forth. And it was the same tree lifeboats, 106 years apart. And lots had changed, but lots of things hadn't changed. That coastline is still very treacherous, but more importantly, it was the same people, people from coastal communities, from Kilmore, Ross Lair, Dunmore, putting other people's, um, looking after other people and putting their own lives at risk. So, so noble uh, what they did, and they did it again. And I said it was, it links every rescue, I suppose, from every life of station. What it is, it's just ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So going back to, um, sorry, we're going the wrong way. Going back to 1884, when the life boat first came to Dunmore, that's a bit what the, the harbour looked like. And you can see the, the fishing smacks there in the bay. They would have probably come from Tenby in Wales and Brixham in, in Devon, because they, they chased the, the herring shoals around the coast wherever they um, happened to be. And that's the village would have looked something like that. Those are the Coast Guard houses, which are still still in use now as, as a private residence, so they're still there. And the hotel on the other side of the road is not looking so well at the moment, but it's still there. And that's the lifeboat station that was built for the, the first lifeboat to arrive in Dunmore East in 1884. And there's from the archives, tells you. The new life of Henry Dodd has been placed on the Dunmore station since July the 7th. The boat has completed subscriptions will be received by any of the committee for the honours secretary. The estimated cost of the station will be £70 per annum, <laughs> which is defrayed by local subscription and I think a subvention from London. And um, all the committee and president was Sir Robert Paul, who's a large landowner from Woodstown in County Waterford and the committee were all very much drawn from a certain privileged sort of class but um, all very good people no doubt. The one named there, Jay Malcolmson of Villa Marina, that's now the, the um, Haven Hotel and the Malcolmsons with a big large shipbuilding uh, firm and um, cotton people from, from Waterford that in that era. And there's the very first lifeboat that came, it was called the Henry Dodd. It came in 1884 and it was on station until 1911. And so what happened during that time? Well, in 1888, it was this famous shipwreck. The ship was the Alfred D. Snow and it had come from um, San Francisco, it was on its way to Liverpool, but it got distressed and uh, made its way up Waterford Harbour and was seen from Dun Dunmore East. But the coxswain of the lifeboat, Captain Cherry, in his wisdom, decided he wasn't putting to sea because they reckoned they wouldn't survive. And so that has been controversial ever since. So this story lingers on in, in Waterford Harbour on both sides. To this day, there's been songs, poems, um, the Strand Tavern in Duncannon was built from the timbers uh, salvaged from the wreck. And also in Dunmore, the uh, Alfred E. Snow bar was attached to the Ocean Hotel. So the name still continues. Later that day, um, Captain Cherry, after he refused to um, put to sea, he resigned on the spot. And later in the day, the lifeboat did actually put to sea with a scratch crew made up mainly, we're told, of uh, fishermen from Tenby. But by the time they reached the uh, Alfred E. Snow, which had gone aground at Broom Hill on the Wexford side of the harbour, it was too late. All 29 on board had been had been lost, but they did make a, a valiant effort. And they, even that is controversial because the story handed down 
uh, through the generations in Don Maurice say that another person took charge of the boat, Jack Dingley, who was home from sea. So uh, in the book, we have the two versions, the official one and also the one that has been handed down traditionally by, by local people. So the truth probably lies somewhere in between, but sadly, 29 people were lost. And that's the um, Alfred E. Snow painted by Brian Clear, a maritime artist who lives in Passage East, mainly associated with County Wexford. And Brian was wonderfully generous with his paintings throughout the book. Uh, absolute gentleman who allowed us to use them. And that's the ship that was shipwrecked. And in Ballyhack in County Wexford, the most of the crew members uh, were, uh, that's where they're buried and there's a memorial there, which you, you can see if anybody's in, in Ballyhack, County Wexford. So that, so. Five years later, in 1893, it wasn't a Henry um, Dodd lifeboat, who was a relief lifeboat, who was on station and it capsized during a rescue. And one member of the crew called Philip Boucher um, didn't make it when the boat it was right and all got back with the exception of Philip and they couldn't reach him and he was lost. And sadly, he was drowned. He was only 21 years of age. And we've dedicated the book to his memory. And a very nice thing has happened that in his family, his younger brother called his eldest son Philip. And that name has been passed down ever since uh, in memory of Philip Boucher. And a number of years ago, he, two Philip Boucher's father and son came to Don Maurice and paid a visit to the life of her to be very welcome. They will be descendants of that Philip Boucher. And when we were in Poole, we were able to see um, his name on the memorial just outside the, the, the college. So it was nice to see there for anybody who's visited Poole. So in 1911, Henry Dodd was replaced by the Fanny Harriet Lifeboat. Now they, they, they didn't have um, color photography then, but Liam Ryan from Better very kindly enhanced us with color and uh, let me use it. I think it's a wonderful uh, picture. That's the lifeboat returning from the feathered disaster with the, um, it would have the five rescued crew members of the feathered lifeboat on board, making their way back. The, um, the Norwegians were on the, um, on the, on the Ross Lair lifeboat. Um, and that is a famous story. And that's how I started writing the book because that's the story I wanted to research and write about, but I ended up writing the full history. And there's uh, another Brian Clear depiction of the disaster to Mexico going aground on the Kirok rocks and the lifeboat attempting to reach them. And the lifeboat was smashed smashed to pieces and five crew members managed to get onto the wreck and then onto the island along with eight members of the, the, the crew of the schooner to Mexico. Two of them had got into a lifeboat and were washed ashore, survived. And while they were on, they were on the island for three days, one of the sailors um, died from exposure. But the other seven survived, and the seven, five feathered men then were rescued on, on the Monday, three days later. That's the, again, Brian's uh, painting of, of the Mexico, and the master was Captain Erickson. And with some, that's the, um, so a depiction of the, of the rescue. You can see where the, um, Ship went ashore on the Kirok Islands in Bano Bay. And the Helen Blake, the lifeboat from Feathered, set out to rescue them, but it itself was wrecked, as I've just mentioned. And word went out, and the Don Maurice lifeboat, Fanny Harriet, they rowed around Hook Head, which was no mean achievement, and got to the island. And the um, Rosslair lifeboat came from what was then Rosslair Fort, which no longer is in existence. 
um, and they got a, a tow from the Wexford tug on their Captain Busher, towed them around to Kirok. And the sisters' lifeboat from Kilmore Key came as well. But on the Saturday and the Sunday, they couldn't get uh, get close enough to effect a rescue. So it wasn't until Monday that that they managed to get them off the island. It was a, a, a wonderful rescue. And that's the um, coxswain of the Dunmore lifeboat called Walter Power, or as he would have been known locally in Dunmore East, as uh, Wattie Robin. Walter Power was his full name. And you can see him wearing his, his medals. He got silver medal, for, obviously, from Jaren Alai, and the other medal is from the King of Norway. And that's the Dunmore East crew from the official record of Brendan very kindly got permission for me to uh, look, research and, and copy. So you can see there's 30 of them went to the rescue and there's six of them that called Power, which is the most popular name in the Murray. So Walter was the, the Cox and there was five other Powers. And you see number seven here, William Bond, we'll talk about, mention him later in the talk. So that was the Dunmore crew. And these are some photographs which um, Brendan Power and Liam Ryan very kindly allowed us to use in the book. That's the uh, the Dunmore lifeboat. And there's one of the feathered men, Tom McNamara, being carried ashore by his, um, sorry, um, John as the rescued volunteer, and Tom is carrying him ashore from the lifeboat. And you might see, if you look closely, you see a man kind of climbing over the gunnel with a, a pole. Well, that's a, a rocket launcher. He was a local man called Ned Bryan. And he's rather an unsung hero of this whole story because he got very little recognition. But he decided to uh, bring a, he borrowed a rocket launcher from Arterstown and went with the lifeboat and fired it and got a line ashore to the men on the island. This what the Dunmore lifeboat got two of the men off before their, their little punt was smashed. Or sorry, no, they got them off on a lifeboat. The, their boat was smashed, but the Wexford or the Rosslair lifeboat got the other 10 people off two at a time using a small punt, which itself got uh, damaged, but they were able to repair the damage by stuffing a loaf of bread into one of the holes. And the um, tell you the people are involved in a minute. So that's uh, one of the survivors coming ashore, being greeted by Mrs. Taylor, who is the uh, wife of the president of the Feathered Lifeboat, the gentleman in the middle with the, the beard, Godfrey Lovelace Taylor, who was the local land agent for the Eli stay, so he wasn't the most popular man in the district. I think we think the other gentleman is the doctor from probably from Duncannon, Dr. She, but that's a guest. There's um, another one of Brian's lovely paintings. That's the Wexford tug towing the Rosslair lifeboat around to the, the rescue. And in 1915, the um, the medalists went to London to receive their medals. And if you look at this photograph, it's quite interesting because the the four Irishmen are all, all together at one side of the uh, tree at the back. The two um, at the back, there's James Wickham and Bill Dogan. They're the two Rosslair crewmen who actually got into the, the pond to get to the island and get the men off. So they were very, very brave men indeed. And you might see they have um, a medal on their chains on their waistcoats. I don't know if you can notice that. And they're medals that the GAA presented to them. And it was unique because it's the only time ever that GAA presented medals for anything apart from on, 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 you know, on field uh, winners. So that was a unique award that those two men got. Um, 
James Wakem and William Duggan, and Walter Power is beside him there in the back row, Dunmore Coxon, and Nader. Edward Wakem is sitting in the front row. He's a, he was the coxswain of the Ross Lair lifeboat. And the gentleman beside him was Commander Holmes, who had come from London. He was sent when this, uh, the alarm was raised, and he sort of um, got a lot of credit for coordinating the rescue, but I think the local people didn't think so highly of him, but he, he got it. He was awarded a medal. So in better to this day, there's a memorial to the nine men who lost their life in the middle of the village. You can see their names there on the memorial. And 100 years later, exactly in 2014, there was a very nice ceremony held when the, the four lifeboats now feathered at this stage um, have, have an inshore lifeboat because immediately after that disaster, the, um, the um, Helen Blake wasn't replaced. So it wasn't until 25 years ago they got an inshore lifeboat and the other three are the Dunmore, the Kilmore and the Rosslair and they came together for a reed laying ceremony when descendants of, this, of those rescued, those lost, and the Norwegian people came, came to the feather for the 100 year centenary. And to remember those who were lost is a, a project in uh, Feather. Now they're building a replica boat, which hopefully will be launched next year. So it's a replica of the Helen Blake. It's a wonderful memorial to those people. And that's the, the workshop, a couple of miles from Feather, where it's been built. And um, there's an awful lot written about that rescue. So, you know, if anybody really interested, you can get it online. Or there's several books. There's uh, Brendan Power's book, and uh, Lee Ryan has a book which may be out of print, but there's a lot you can learn about it, as I did, newspapers and so forth. So just after that, Don Maurice got its first motor life out in this set. The ironic thing, if it had come maybe a month earlier, better it wouldn't have had a life out because it would have been withdrawn and the Helen Blake wouldn't have been there to go to the rescue and those men wouldn't have been lost. But that's, these things happen, unfortunately. So that was a motor, a converted rowing and sailing lifeboat converted as a motorboat, and it was five years on station in No Morris. It was called the Michael Henry, and it had come from New Haven in Sussex. And it didn't enjoy, I'd say, the greatest period in the lifeboat history. It was in 1919, it was withdrawn and wasn't replaced until six years later. It only rescued, I think, four people in that time. It seemed to spend uh, difficulty getting crews during those years. Because the Coast Guards would have been probably only with so probably elderly Coast Guards, as all the young men had probably seconded to the, to the Navy. And it wasn't a happy, I'd say, occasion. But there was one very famous rescue that took place during that time, and it involved three young men who probably would have gone on the lifeboat if it had been available, but it was it was um, on the hard at the time. And they were the two Power Brothers and Jack McGrath. There was an explosion at sea one night on 4th of August 1917, and it was a German submarine that was blown, blown up. It may have hit one of its own mines, or it may have hit a, a mine that hadn't been um, and you know, taken away, so nobody's quite sure, but it blew up. It was three sailors in the conning tower, and they got to the surface. Two of them were drowned, but one man stayed swimming, and that was the commander, Kurt Tevin Johans. And the three Dunmore men heard him in the water and were able to rescue him and brought him ashore. He was taken by the authorities and brought to London for questioning, but he, he was alive. And, but what was more important was that the 
Admiralty now had a, a U boat and they decided to, um, to um, raise it. And um, as I say there in the text, a few weeks later, Don Maurice became the center of a naval espionage operation that saw the destruction of a U boat, the dramatic rescue by three young Dunmore fishermen and her captain, the only survivor, the subsequent interrogation and the salvage operation to lift the boat from the depths of water at Harbour followed. And um, I'll read the text if I may. The information found in the submarine was of paramount value. The Admiralty learned from the papers found in the control room that the network across the Straits of Dover was not stopping German submarines. The Admiralty and Admiral Bacon, who commanded the Dover patrol in the Straits, had rejected this as being unlikely. The salvagers at Dunmore learned that the submarines had worked out tactics for getting through with comparative ease, while at the same time they were to pretend it was exceedingly different, difficult. Thus, any submarines which went into the Irish Sea by way of the north of Scotland were instructed to show themselves on the surface as much as possible the idea being to give the illusion that they did not dare go around England any other way. The salvage of the submarine led to the discovery of many useful technical details about the methods of laying mines and the constructions of submarines. I say there, the submarine crew died not knowing that the salvage of UC-44 was to lead eventually to a sacking at the top of the Admiralty and a change in anti-submarine tactics in the English Channel. Admiral Sir Reginald Bacon, commander of the Dover Patrol, was removed from office by Eric Campbell Geddes, first Lord of the Admiral. So all that happened in 1917. And 100 years later, in Dunmore East, it was a very nice uh, memorial service commemoration of the events of 1917 when not only was the rescue of um, Captain Heaven Johannes, but also the crews of two naval trawlers that were lost in Waterford Harbour. They were uh, minesweepers and they're buried in County Wexford at Templetown. So those um, um, people, uh, sailors and um, the German sailors were all remembered in a very nice uh, weekend of commemoration. We had a, a beautiful concert, a walk around the village, wreath laying and uh, an exhibition as you can see there. And it was a, a wonderful tribute and uh, well done to everybody involved in, in that. So as I said, 1919, the station closed and was intended to uh, replace it, but then replacement life didn't come to 1925. I think that was a sort of uh, as a result of the war and the life boats not being constructed and so forth. But 1925, the CNS life boat came on station, and that was there until 1940. And that photograph would have been taken at Cowes when it was on trial, not at Dunmore East. And every life Boat at that stage was built in cows that were well photographed by a, a family who were, lived on cows. It was a great uh, archive in in the RNI and I of all these old life boats taken by this family called Beacon. And you can see it, it also could sail, so some of the old gaffers might like to see that. I don't think it ever sailed at the more east, but uh, it was capable of, of, of sailing in addition to having an, an engine. And that's it there on its moorings, 19, well, 1913, you can see the, the yacht's been rigged to go, go racing. Um, now, that's the first shipwreck it went to. It does was in near Strad Valley in County Waterford. But by, by the time they reached it, it was a ship called the Cirilo Amaros. Spanish ship, the um, crew had got ashore, they'd been brought ashore by breaches by by local. So their shout was in vain, but that was the first rescue they went on. And then 
was several other ones during the 1930s. So there was the one in 1936 where they searched for hours looking for a ship called the Baron Graham, which they didn't find. But it, the ship uh, survived, it, it wasn't lost. The lifeboat was sea for hours, and that's where the uh, title of the book comes from the, Those Men Had Dauntless Courage. And two years later, 1938, they put to the sea again when. Word came that a ship called the Republic of Panama was in trouble. And in those days, like messages sort of came. They didn't have any the modern navigational aids. And they just went to sea in the hope of finding it. And they didn't find it. There was, and people thought when they left that they'd never really get back. It was so, the weather was so bad. They went, they couldn't be seen when except at the crest of the waves as they set out. And William Bond, who had been on the rescue in 1914, he took charge of the lifeboat. And he was only a crew member, but both Coxon and second Coxon were absent. And Willie Bond took charge and he got a, an award the following year in, in, from, from RMI in, in London. Sadly, he died shortly after, so he didn't live long to uh, enjoy his, his reward. And in 1940, this lifeboat came and it was there for 30 years now, which is the longest of any of the Don Maurice lifeboats. That was the Annie Blanche Schmidt. So that when I was growing up, that was the lifeboat we had. And I would have been on that several times as a boy, going, getting on board, probably not meant to, but. I'd roll out my dinghy and go on board and talk to Dick Murphy, who was the mechanic, and he'd be checking the engines, the two engines, which I thought was wonderful, a boat with two engines. And it was, everything was pristine, it shone, the brass, it was a, I thought it was so, such a lovely boat. Um, and that was there until 1970. It immediately got to work as in 19... 41, it was involved in the rescue of tr three survivors from this Dutch cargo ship, which was um, struck a mine off the Smalls, off the Welsh coast. And it's a, a sad story, and it can be, um, the full story can be um, accessed. I think it will, it'll be in the chat for anybody that would like to take a note and read it in, in detail and in English as well as in, in, in Dutch. So the ship lost its way off the smalls because its compass was had been affected by a degaussing mech or procedure to um, you know to, to um, guard it against um, mines it was, it, it was ships it was hit or a hit a mine started to sink and it was abandoned, but it didn't, the ship didn't sink. And the, in their wisdom, they all got back on board and sent an SOS out, which now, and nobody came to their rescue. And then the ship began to sink and they abandoned the ship for a second occasion. But the power of the ship sinking capsized the lifeboat and most of the crew were lost. But four men got away on a life raft. And they drifted. And that would be more or less off the smalls where they were hit the mine. And that shows you the sort of distance from the smalls right across to Brownstown Head in County Waterford, where the four men drifted on the raft for about four days. Now, one of them was lost. He, he died of exposure. But the other three, survived and they were spotted from Brownstown Head, where the one of those lookout posts that they had during World War II was stationed. And they were the three sailors who survived. And uh, S.W. Gillard, he was a, a British sailor, actually. The other two were from the Netherlands and they were rescued. And that's where they were spotted. And you see, Brown, that's Brownstown Head with it in the centre. Look outpost, which was manned 24 
seven during the war years, watching out. And the man who bought him, he was on duty at the time. That's John Bulligan Power from uh, Coxtown. He was on duty and along with his cousin, David Tobin, they rode out to attempt to rescue the men on the raft, but uh, they weren't successful. Their oars broke and they were unable to get to the raft. And it says this newspaper, they had a they had a tough struggle to get ashore again. But the lifeboat was called and it came and they got the men in the nick of time just as it was going onto the rocks at Tramor at the uh, Metal Man, the lookout post up close. And that's the bellman from the rescue. That's um, Davy Buck Murphy. He was the bravest. He got, got the men aboard. And his photograph is in the Lifeboat Station in Dunmore now as a fitting memorial to that brave act. And as the report says, the official report from the station said, only by the most skillful manoeuvring, the coxswain was able to get to the windward of the frail craft and take the almost unconscious sailors on board and proceed with all haste back to Belmore. So there's a nice little backstory to this. Um, there's a Dutch maritime writer called J.P. Van Kuyk. And he was in this, I think, small coastal town called Bergen of Zoom, which is an appropriate name tonight. He was in a pub and he was looking at the wall and he saw this picture on the wall in the pub. And being a sort of historian, he wondered what, who was this person, what it was all about, and he started to dig. He researched the story of the SS Beams to Dyke, because that was the uh, apprentice engineer who was one of the men lost. So he came upon the story and did a lot of research. And in 2014, he came back as part of his research. He came back to Dunmore East to see where the men had been rescued. And he met the lifeboat crew at that stage. And they brought him out, showed him exactly where it happened. And they brought him over land and he saw uh, from the land that's the uh, lookout post and then before he left he spent a week in Don Morris and before he left he gave a talk at the lifeboat station on all his research to date and what he found because he'd also gone to St David's Head in Wales where the lifeboat that was meant to have gone to the rescue the station now whatever reason it never arrived and sadly, those those men were were lost, apart from the three rescued, but they done more life. So that you're looking now at Paddy Billy Power, who was the coxswain from 1947 to 1966. But in back in 1941, we're going backwards, just a month after the Beamster Day rescue of the three men on the raft. A Belgian trawler, and you might say, what was a Belgian trawler doing in County Waterford? Well, it was based for, during the war years in Swansea, so it was fishing. It was a Swansea, it was about to go on the rocks at um, Dunner Bratton, a few miles west of Tramore, and the Dunmore lifeboat. Uh, he wasn't coxswain at the time, he was second coxswain, but he was at the helm that night. There were seven crew members were rescued, and the following day, then they managed with the help of a steam trawler to get the, um, the fishing boat um, off the rocks and, and save it. But the previous day, they had saved the, the seven men. And for that rescue, Paddy Billy Power was awarded a bronze medal. And there was be the first of four metal, bronze medals that he received during his career, which is a remarkable record. That was the first one in 1941. And exactly 10 years later, 
in 1951. That small trawler that you see there, well, at, at the time it would have been an average size trawler. We now see it as small, but then it would have been the normal size of St. Declan or the Nave Deglon, it was often, often called. It was out fit, herring fishing, drifting, and they lost the engines, failed as was quite a normal occurrence. But they were very close to this rock west of Dunmore East called Falskar Rock. It was not a place in bad weather, and it was a blizzard, a snow blizzard at the time. It's not a place you'd want to be, and that's a sort of night. That's the rock up close, so you can see how treacherous it was. And just in the nick of time, the lifeboat got in and rescued the five men just at the very last minute. So it was a, a marvellous, marvellous rescue. And I just read, this is a newspaper report. I didn't write this, this was a local paper. I just read it, I think it's significant. The lifeboat crew searched the sea for the boat and at first were unable to locate it and then to their amazement, Found a ship's length of going onto the false cart rocks to their utmost risk of the lifeboat and crew. The members, I think that must be crew members, went in amongst the rocks. The, des the stress boat had previously put an anchor and sent out flares, but owing to the big seas, the anchor chain was smashed and the boat was been driven onto the cliff. It slew up the boat from making towards the cliffs and their doom, the fishing crew threw out the herring net and this formed a break from being swept onto the rocks and subsequent grounding. Just in the nick of time, the lifeboat crew threw them a line and saved them in only a matter of moments. The fishing boat would have been smashed to atoms with the loss of five men. That was 1951. And Paddy Billy Parr received his second bronze medal for that rescue. And his cousin, Richie Power, who was the second coxswain, he, he received a bronze medal as well. And there they are, together with Mr. Arthur Westcott Pitt, who was the secretary of the lifeboat at that time in 1951. <clears throat> and that's Paddy Billy Power in London with the Duchess of Kent getting his, sec his second bronze medal. He was he was to be there two more times during his career, which again, I say is remarkable. Now, this is a, a story that um, old gaffers will, will be interested in. Um, that's a, a catch. I called it a schooner, but I was, uh, had my knuckles wrapped, I was corrected. But it, uh, it used to bring coal from Devon or sorry, from Wales to Devon and so forth. You know, it was about, um, about 50 years old. And when it was in Drogheda in 1952, it's pretty in pretty poor state, so the owners decided to sell it and it was bought by a, a young marine engineer who got the bright idea of he'd sail single-handedly on it to America. So on Holy, his name was uh, Lawler, on Holy, or yeah, Holy Saturday, that's Easter, uh, 1952. He set sail from Holt, and all his sort uh, of friends and that uh, were on board as far as the Kish, but he um, then they, they all got, got off and left, and so he was left on his own. And the plan was to sail to America, but he didn't know that there was a stowaway on board, so he came, made himself known a few hours later. He wasn't alone, so it was now he had a, a companion, but they didn't get very far. They got around the Wexler coast and the engine failed and they tried to get it started. And on the Monday, early on the mon Monday morning in, in their endeavours to get the engine started, uh, it went on fire and the ship began to burn. And the lighthouse keeper at the hook, he spotted the on duty, saw what was happening. He made his way to Slade, where they got a motorboat. Now he had learned to done where he slide boat, but he knew time was of the essence. So he got to Slade with a motorboat, and they set off in attempt to, and they got in the nick of time, just as the uh, 
the schooner, the catch went into, went really on fire. They were in the water, but they were rescued and the life lifeboat arrived just, just as the men were um, saved by the, the motorboat, but they were taken aboard the lifeboat. But um, a year or two later, my father decided we'd go and see, the, we'd drive to County Wexford, which was a long drive, we'd go and see this, uh, where the boat eventually went ashore a couple of miles along in Sandeel Bay from the hook. And I, and I was a small boy at the time. And that's there, the idea I had in my head was, you know, a shipwreck on the coast would sailing ship would look like it was sort of very romantic sails flapping in the wind and sea breaking over her but then when we got there this is what we saw just a black a black shell so it was very disappointing uh, that was the burnt out uh, Saint Estelle and that happened in 1952 1956 that a Milford trawler, Milford trawlers were very popular, did a lot of fishing off the water on Wexford coast at that time. And that one went ashore on the hook in a bad in a storm. And the Dunmore lifeboat took um, the crew were in their in their lifeboat um, down to the gunnels, but they, they were saved by the Dunmore lifeboat and brought back uh, to Dunmore East. But, um, the trawler wasn't refloated, it, it, it broke up finally and was abandoned. So that was the Merchant Vanguard, 1956. And 1958, <clears throat> this was a very tragic um, disaster in Dunmore. Achille Beggs fishing boat, they left Dunmore East. The plan was to go up the river to water for the shelter because there was a storm coming. All the other boats were doing the same. That was a normal procedure. Get better shelter up the river because Dunmore was very exposed to an orderly gale. But as they were about 300 metres off the pier, they were hit by a giant wave, which it turned turtle. There was one man on deck, four of them were below her in the wheelhouse. And they were lost. The man on deck was swept overboard. And one of the following boats uh, threw a line and it, he gripped it and was saved. So it was a miraculous um, rescue. And the lifeboat put, put to sea. I mean, nobody was found. And the uh, boat ended up on, on the rocks and was smashed to pieces. But lots of people witnessed it from the village was a very traumatic incident, very sad. I can remember it myself. I can remember the birds, seabirds stopped. You know, there was it wasn't a pin. You couldn't hear a pin, you couldn't hear a bird. It was so such a sad occasion. So now 64, <clears throat> this is a small Dutch coast that I went on the rocks. Not far from that fishing boat where it ended up. And the crew were taken off, taken off by Reaches by to the lifeboat, and two of the lifeboat crew got into the lifeboat punt and went sort of halfway between the boat and the uh, ship and the lifeboat to act as a sort of bridge. And the, all the crew were taken off, I think, in, in two attempts. So, for that rescue, again, medals were awarded and that's the crew, they went to London to receive their, their medals. Three of them went. And uh, just, that's the, so Paddy Billy Power got his third bronze medal and Stephen Whittle was a crew member and John Rocky Power, they were awarded uh, bronze medals because they were the two men that manned the boat, which was a very brave thing to do indeed. So they, Three of them went to London and got their medals. And this little, nice little backstory. That was 1950, um, sorry, 65, they went to London. And that man there in the photograph was a farmer from County Kerry. 
who had rowed two miles in a curragh and saved a fisherman on the, off the rocks in the North Kerry coast. They had come from the Aran Islands in a fishing boat and, and lost power, and the boat went onto the rocks. Two fishermen went, jumped into the sea, and the Patrick O'Connor, the he was a farmer and a local sergeant rescued him, but one of them uh, lost his life. He couldn't be resuscitated, but one, one man was saved. So they were, they should have gone to London to receive their medals, but because the local sergeant <coughs> wasn't given permission to travel because it wasn't deemed appropriate that a sergeant should be going to, to, to London. Um, he wasn't given permission to travel which was of the time, and Patrick O'Connor, well, he wasn't going to go on his own, so he declined the invitation. But happily, sometime later, the RNLI came to Ireland and he did receive their medals. But Mr. Westcott Pitt, who was secretary of the Dunmore Lifeboat, while they were in London, wrote him a an, an note um, congratulating him and saying he was missed. And when Patrick O'Connor died a number of years ago, his family were going through um, documents and they found the, the letter and they sent it on to Don Maurice Lifeboat and um, Neville Murphy, who was the um, um, press officer, um, sent it on to me. So I think it's a, a nice story. But that was 1965, and there the, the medalists that from that festival. Then two years later, Paddy Billy Power re returned. Now, there was one medal I forgot to mention. That was in 1961. A man decided to bring two barges up the river uh, from Dunmore. He was the hard master of New Ross. He set off in one barge, towing the other one, and um, went onto the rocks close, not very far from the harbour. And the lifeboat rescued him and they saved one of the barges. One went on the rock and it was a, that was his third bronze medal. So that happened in 1961. Well, the rescue was in 60, sorry, but the uh, medal award was in 61. So that was his third of his four medals. And the other man is Dick Murphy, who was the mechanical, mechanical engineer, I think 30, Eight years, so they retired together in 1966, giving great service to Don Maurice Lifeboat. And the Annie Blanche Smith left in 1970, and then there was a, a four year, sorry, a five year period. So a transition period when lifeboats from the relief fleet came to Don Maurice and were stationed there because they were waiting on a new. Waveney lifeboat, which was promised, that didn't come to 1975. So the first of these lifeboats was the Douglas Hyde, which is a very famous lifeboat because it had been stationed in Ross Lair prior to that and had been involved in a very famous uh, rescue in 1954 when the tanker called the World Concord broke in two in the Irish Sea. And uh, some of the crew most of the crew were at one end, I think the stern end, and others were in the bow. And the St. David's lifeboat from Wales took off, I think, the, the bow crew. But the um, Ross Lair lifeboat saved the men on the stern section and got them to Hollyhead and didn't get back to Ross Lair for a long, long while. They were at sea for something like could have been 70 hours. It was an amazing rescue. So that was the. Douglas Hyde, so that was 70 to 72. Now, during that time, <clears throat> this very famous rescue took place. And funny, it's on this day, 51 years ago, 25th of January, I think about November 1970, the Glen Malore fishing boat built in Tyrrells of Arklow and from Kilmore Quay, skippered by Jimmy Bates, who was also the Coxon of the Kilmore lifeboat and it went on the rocks at Hook Head and the Dunmore lifeboat under Stephen Whittle, who was the new coxswain, 
they saved three men with one young fisherman, Pat Barry, was lost, unfortunately, but the other three men were rescued and brought to them were east. And that was Stephen. He'd been appointed coxswain when Paddy Billy retired, and he's a, another famous John Murray's coxswain. So he talk, talking about years later in a, an interview he gave for the Lifeboat magazine, he said, I reckon that was the worst service anybody in the moor had ever been out. They were really crazy seas that night. We wouldn't like to see them again, even in the new boat. And the new boat was the, the Waveney, the, um, the, the St. Patrick that came in 1975. And that's Jimmy Bates, the sk uh, skipper of the uh, St. Malheur, after he was rescued and brought into Dunmore, given a cup of tea by Mrs. Mary McGraw, probably in the, um, the Fisherman's Hall, where they were probably brought. And that's Hook Head, where the rescue took place, as you can see. I'm sure a lot of you know it from sailing around. It's a very treacherous place, not a place you'd like to go ashore on. And that's the crew of the lifeboat. They received their certificates then the following year. And Stephen in the middle. And at the end there with the very long hair, that's Jofie Murphy, who was later to become the, the coxswain. And um, I think he was only 17 at the time and probably shouldn't have even been on the crew, but he he was there that night and there many years later. And <clears throat> the Irish press had a very nice editorial at the time. Um, probably won't read it to you, but if you like to scan through it, the end there says, it is fitting then that a salute should be paid to the bravery and skill of the crew of the Dunmore East Lifeboat for their rescue of members of the crew of the trawler, the Glen Malure, which foundered in a forced nice gale off Hookhead on Wednesday. The performance of Cox and Stephen Whittle and his crew was in the best tradition of the lifeboat service. The rescue has rightly captured public attention and admiration. It's heartening to know that we haven't amid such men. So that was a nice tribute paid by the Irish press to the crew in 1970. Then the Dunleary, old Dunleary lifeboat, the Dunleary 2 came, spent a year on station in Dunmore. I don't think it was involved in any major rescues. Um, there was um, a lone sailor was rescued, but I think that's the story we won't cover tonight, but it, it's in the book. Um, and there was an attempt hoping to sail to Australia, but he didn't seem to get as far as Cork, and we don't know what happened and subsequently. He was into dog by one mishap after another. And then in the following year, in 73, and for two years, this um, Difficultly pronouncing it, but you, you oh, you, your guess is good as mine. It was you you Frosini Kendall uh, was a station that life would come from Guernsey again. It would have been in the relief fleet, very old, famous lifeboat that probably served during World War Two in Guernsey. So it was there in seventy five, and during that time. This was a famous um, rescue that took place. It was a, um, the, S, or the MV Michael of Famagusta lost power at sea and was drifting, drifting towards the coast. And the lifeboat went to its rescue, found it which, with some difficulty and took off the crew. Now the <clears throat> ship then continued drifting. And then that up there at Tremor Beach in Tremor County, Waterford, where it lay for some time until it was sort of finally broke, broken up. It had a cargo of coal which was taken off and carted away. But um, it was a very famous rescue, which um, St Stephen Whittle was uh, rewarded with. 
Um, so I'll just read you the, uh, this is from the official report. Master of Michael decided to abandon ship. He was instructed to make sure that his crew were warmly dressed and wearing life jackets before taking to the life raft. When, the, when in the life raft, they were to veer down from Michael on a light line and would be picked up by the lifeboat. This the master agreed to do. The life raft was launched on the port quarter and ensured alongside head and stern. It was about 200 hours and the lifeboat had moved to a position about one cable off the port side of Michael looming and illuminating the life raft with her searchlight. Each of the crew was counted into the lifeboat. Into the life raft, it was now a delay of some 15 to 20 minutes during which time the lifeboat discovered by signs that there was no knife in the life raft. Cox and Whittle was just about to attempt to go alongside with Master found a small pair of scissors to paint her successfully cut. And for this service, the thanks of the institution inscribed in vellum were awarded Cox and Stephen Whittle and certificates to the second Cox and John Welch, both mechanic John Carton, assistant mechanic John Kern, uh, the other members of the crew there. And the life belt from the ship is on display in the lifeboat station tonight. Memento and thank you from the crew for the rescue. So finally in 1975, this lovely new lifeboat, it was a Waveney class, which was similar to the one that had been stationed in Dunleary a few, few years earlier. The um, and it was with the Anna Liffey, I think, or maybe it was, the, could have been the Dunley, I can't remember the name of the one station in Dunley, but it's the same class or Waveneys. And um, <clears throat> they were bottled on a US Coast Guard ship. And that was in Dunmore from 75 to 96. And Stephen Whittle would have been the first coxswain of the new lifeboat. And that's in photograph with the, the lifeboat in, in the background. So we were now, as they say, in the era of fast lifeboats. So I'll just read you the um, piece here. In March 75, the station was upgraded when a 44-foot Waveney class lifeboat was placed on service. Same St. Patrick and built by Groves of Guthridge. And it was funded from an Irish lifeboat appeal in 74 to mark the 100 50th anniversary of the RNLI. In her 41 years of Dunmore East St. Patrick was launched 252 times and is credited with saving 83 lives. Just over a year after she arrived, St. Patrick was involved in yet another medal winning service. On the 9th of July 1976, the lifeboat saved local man Colin Power from a small 18 foot boat which had been washed on the first skirt rocks in heavy swell, the lifeboat in danger of being damaged or having our propellers fouled by ropes and nets during the rescue. And Stephen received a silver medal for that for that famous rescue. And sadly, Colin's brother was was lost, but one one his brother was was saved. And that happened in 1976. And th three years later. This famous event happened. It was the 1979 holding of the of the Fastnet race. And most of, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Fastnet race. But for anybody who isn't, and maybe one or two viewers, it's a famous race that takes place every year and it begins at Cowes, at the Isle of Wight, and they sail around the Tillys across around Fastnet Lighthouse and then back to Plymouth. So it's a fairly tough course. And that year, 1979, a storm broke and devastation took place. And I'll just show you a little piece of footage, which I think you enjoy.
that, that, that video was made two years ago for the 40th anniversary of the that fam famous rescue by all the, the lifeboats from <clears throat> England, Wales, uh, and Ireland. And those are some nice photographs in, in the, the book, which Cormac very kindly gave, gave to us. And then in 2019, they, there was a, a little ceremony took place in Waterford Harbour Sailing Club when Matthew Power, who was one of the rescued sailors from 40 years earlier, he came back to meet the four members of the, the crew who had rescued him. Sadly, one of them, Sean Cairns, had passed away, but the other four were there to, to meet Matthew. So there was a very nice ceremony took place that time. Uh, two years ago to mark that, that rescue. And um, a special, all those lifeboat stations received a special um, certificate at that time. That's the Dunmore East one listing the, the crew. Um, Stephen Whittle, who was, was the coxswain, was uh, actually on holiday, so he wasn't he wasn't on that rescue. And <clears throat> John Murphy took took charge, acting coxswain, and did a, a very brave sound job and um, they were awarded a certificate which you can see there and um, so that was the fasteners of 1979. Now five years later um, it was the centenary so dunmore has got a, a special vellum for the centenary and by that stage this man here, John Welsh, now we in Waterford it's called Welsh, it's not pronounced Walsh. I call him John Welsh, as everybody else in some ways would call him. Uh, John became the the new coxswain. Uh, he, he was a, a harbour pilot very, and had been at sea in the early part of his career, so a very good seaman, very compassionate man, and very involved in and um, a number of things. If you now have reflective strips on your life jackets when you put to sea, you can probably thank John because he led a campaign to int introduce those because it was a famous rescue. Um, where, as John said, if only that had been in place, they probably could have saved the two canoes who were drowned. Uh, they searched and searched for them and couldn't find them. John was very distraught over that. To come back to in a minute now. That year, '84, I've just thrown in this photograph that Bill Levy very kindly let us use in the book, and it's the um, you probably know what it is. It's the Ascar, but it's out of the water, which probably people wouldn't have seen. It had been the gunnel had been damaged on a voyage from Milford Haven, so it was lifted out of the water. It done more to be repaired. And Bill was on that, that voyage as a crew member, so he had that photograph, so just thought you might like to see that. That was 1984. So this is um, John. John, when he retired in 1996, um, John O'Connor, who was a journalist in Waterford, wrote about him. And, John, you, you might think you haven't heard of him, but you, a lot of you would be familiar with John because for a long number of years, he did the um, provincial newspapers on drive time with Mary Wilson. Every Friday night, he used to come on and give his take on the, the provincial papers. He had a very distinctive voice, which I'm sure you may remember. John, John is a, a very excellent writer and journalist, now retired, but he wrote about um, John said he was a courageous and compassionate man. And, um, and he talked about it. John's um, mission to get um, life jackets having reflective uh, strips on them, which I think he succeeded. So everybody should be very grateful for John for that. And the <clears throat> other thing he's very much responsible for was the memorial garden to all those lost at sea in Dunmore East in 1996, a small fishing trawler 
called the Jenna Lisa was lost in <clears throat> uh, Tramore Bay. And the bodies were never recovered. And it's a very traumatic, very distressed, stressful for the community, families of those lost. And John was very much to the forefront, along with the mother of one of the boys lost in <clears throat> getting this memorial ball, raising the money, having it erected. And, um, so a lot of credit is due to John for that. And if you look on the wall, there's a, a beautiful poem which John O'Connor, the man I mentioned there, the journalist, wrote. And that's on the wall. And I think it's, I'm really fond of it. And that's it there. And if you forgive me, I'll, I'll read it out to you. I just really think it's wonderful. It's called Souls of the Sea. On misty nights off Dunmore East, so the story goes. Twinkling lights far out at sea shine out in sad repose. No one knows who they are, but the talk is on the keys. They're the ghosts of long lost ships and men who sail the sea. Spanish galleons. Fishing smacks a German submarine lie together neat the waves where light is never seen. But perhaps a tearful teardrop finds its way to the moonlight up above. The light reflected sends a sign to the ones on shore they love. Say a prayer for the souls of the sea who never reach the land. They say as many men lie there as they are grains of sand. They'd haul their nets, hoist their sails, set their course no more. Say a prayer for the souls of the sea who rest just off Dunmore and kindly allowed us to be used in the book by John O'Connor. So thank you very much. 1988, and this is a story which, uh, as the old gaffers will find interesting, and it's not actually in the book because at the time we couldn't find the name of the, the hooker that, was, um, that sank in Waterford Harbour. And without the, the name and some more detail, I, I was reluctant to put in because it wouldn't have meant very much. But subsequently, I got a lot of help from people. And um, we found out that the hooker that sank, but the crew were rescued. They got into the life raft, saved by the lifeboat. And the hooker was the Mona too, which had previously been owned by Dennis Aylmer. It was a glut hog. And at that stage, it was owned by Professor Cosby of Stradbally Hall, County Leash. And he, he uh, sadly, it, it, it sank, capsized, excuse me, it sank, and um, crew were rescued, but the, um, it sank to the bottom. So it wasn't there. The vessel wasn't, um, wasn't um, saved. And, um, What's significant about the rescue that, that Francis Glody, who was one of the crew, and Francis holds its distinction in 1981, a few years earlier, being the very first female crewman, crew member of a, an all weather lifeboat anywhere in the British Isles. Um, so she was a trailblazer. Now there's lots of them. And uh, there's even a Bennett have a the coxswain is, is uh, female, so, but at that time, Francis was the first, so Dunmore, uh, very proud of that achievement to this very day. And that, then 1996, this life auto arrived, the, um, the Trent class, Elizabeth and Ronald, which is, has been there up to only th uh, three weeks ago. So for the rest of the history, that's the lifeboat in situ. And you can see Coxon, Walter Abraham, son there on board. And that's his dad, Walter, who was the first coxswain of the Elizabeth and Ronald. So it's a nice, it was a nice uh, thing for Roy to become coxswain of the same lifeboat that dad had been previously a uh, coxswain. Uh, he, he brought a life out to Dunmore in 1996. Now, he was only coxswain for a, a year, but he, prior to that, he, he, made, he made a big impact on, on the village and on the life of service. So he's very well remembered. 
sadly is not, no longer with us. Uh, originally from Sweden, as his name would suggest, came to Dunmore fishing and stayed married and then had his family. And Roy is his, his son. In after Roy, Jofi Murphy became the coxswain, and next two stories revolve around um, yachts. The first one happened in, uh, there isn't a, a graphic or an image, but it happened in 2000 when a professional French female loan, one of these loan solo yachtswomen, uh, lost her keel about 40 miles, five miles out to sea. And Dunmore, I put under Jofie Murphy, set out. And uh, Jofie spoke flu fluent French, so that helped. And he rescued her. And the yacht was towed back to Dunmore. And a couple of years later, she came, I think, 13 to run the round the world race. So thanks to the Dunmore lifeboat and the rescue, she was there to take. Take, take part, otherwise it might have been a very different story. But in 2002, this small yacht from Strangford, Lock, um, the uh, skipper was Don Campbell, and they were making their way back from, they'd been in Sherbourg, coming back to Ireland, and got into a distress state through seasickness and worry about shortage of fuel. And um, it became a very distressed voyage, and he put out an SOS and was rescued by Dunmore Life. Of what he did, he <clears throat> he wrote a letter of thank you to the station, and he set out, told them how how, how marvelous. So, as it says there, the spirits were lifted when the lifeboat was sighted, and I thought this was a. a Usually we have a rescue from a third party, which was this was nice to have a rescue described by uh, the person who was rescued, and he very kindly let us uh, use it in the book. So this is what uh, Don wrote, and I'll read it for you. He's a lifeboat crew showed incredible precise manoeuvring skills and teamwork during the line attachment. Their patience and perseverance in dealing with horrible communication conditions given the noise of the wind and waves and our incapacitated crew was impressive. The control which was used to get the Trent lifeboat close to my boat during the two line throwing operations was flawless. Although at times we seemed to be about to hit the Trent, the coxswain moved her away and then back again, always in command of the situation. I was so impressed by the professionalism and focus of the lifeboat crew that night the Coast Guard later told me that conditions were gale force eight and up to nine at times during the rescue and the trip to the harbour. Later that day, the fuel was checked in calm conditions and found to be more than adequate for the distance remaining at the Pan Pan location. However, even removing the fuel concerned five hours motoring over 25 di difficult miles in those conditions, short, show shorthand it would have been extremely risky. So that's um, a rescue coming from the rescue rather than through a third party. So I thought it was nice to include it in the book. 2005, now this is not a rescue, but Waterford was graced by having the uh, as a stop off for, for the, these tall ships and some wonderful ships came to water. Now they also came six years later in 2011, but the 2005 was the first visit and the, as the parade of sail took place down the river and set off for the next port, which may have been Sherbrooke, I can't remember. Um, they could be viewed from Don Morris and it was a wonderful sight. That's, there is the Dun Brody, which is a replica ship, which is in New Ross and can it's now a visitor attraction. That was it out in the open sea in the Dunmore lifeboat. And this was a Russian sailing ship, which I believe was the second largest in the world. So quite a famous ship. Don't ask me to pronounce the name, but it's quite a 
and I failed that in like two mistakes. So gaffers I thought you might like to see those. And that's a painting of the Don, Don Brody coming down, passing to Barrow Bridge on its way from New Ross to Waterford Harbour. And that was painted by my good friend, the late John Coulter, who was a, a wonderful marine artist and gave us several paintings and photographs for his family to, for, the, for the book. Now, <clears throat> in 2006, there were some very sad events took place off the Waterford and Wexford coast. In 2006, a trawler called the Maggie B was lost, it sank. And um, two of the crew were lost, but one, one crewman was saved. And I'll read you a little official report from the RN and I about it, if you bear with me. The service which commenced on 29th of March 2006 ended on 31st of March 2006. So that's how long the lifeboat was at sea searching. It resulted in the award of a framed letter of thanks signed by the chairman of the Institute, Admiral Sir Jock Slater, being awarded the coxswain, Joseph Murphy, and a collective framed letter of thanks signed by the chairman of the institution, also being rewarded as station and an exceptional first aid certificate signed by the chairman of the medical and survival subcommittee, Mr. Roger Vickers, was awarded to crew member Neville Murphy for his exemplary first aid treatment of a severely hypothermic Polish fisherman who had been recovered from a semi-submerged life raft in atrocious conditions. The fishing vessel Maggie B had suddenly foundered in very poor weather conditions. So that happened in 2006. And if you think things, things could only get worse, the following year, we had not only one trawler, but two trawlers were lost in quick succession off the Wexford and Waterford coast. The first one was the Pear Charles. <clears throat> Five men sadly lost their, their lives. And the honeydew from Kinsale went down the following day, which is amazing. It had been on its way, I think, to search for the um, Pear Charles, but it sank. But one fisherman was rescued, which we'll come to. But that was a very, very sad occasion. And um, for anybody who would like to find out more, re um, Damien Tiernan has written a, w a wonderful book, very sad book, but a a wonderful account of the of the, the two um, tragedies, and it's he named it Souls of the Sea, and that book should probably be still available. So it's, it's well worth getting and reading for anybody interested. And that's the where the two trawlers were lost: the Pear Charles sort of close off the hook, and the Honeydew of Ram Head in West County Waterford. So all that happened in two thousand and seven. And um, there's um, some of the small amount of the text from the book. Um, no sooner had the sort of Pear Charles um, rescue on the second day when stood down, they got news of the Honeydew. At 1740, um, the MRWC launched an official search for the Honeydew Second, along with the Elizabeth and Ronald the crew of Rescue 117, whose helicopter was based at Waterford Airport, were involved in the rescue. Winchman Neville Murphy, who had volunteered as a crew member of the Elizabeth and Ronald the previous evening, now finds himself a vital member of Rescue 117. Just like the lifeboat having a brief rest period between searches, the helicopter is back in the air only minutes after searching all day for survivors of the pair Charles in that, on our way to the last known position of the Honey Jew. Miraculously, the, honey, the helicopter found two survivors of the Honey Jew, too, in a life raft about 15 miles from where the tragic vessel had found her. The two survivors were both from Lithuania. 
and the helicopter airlifted them safely in our to Waterford Airport. The wreck of the Honeydew was located on the seabed on the 23rd of January. With the two men still on board, they were sadly never found, and that would have included the, the skipper. Um, but the pair Charles, no one was saved from that. So it was a very, very sad time off the water of the Wexford coast. And that's from the official report from the lifeboat station praising the, the crew. So that no sooner had Elizabeth Ronald been made ready for sea after being stood down from the search for Pear Charles, she was requested to launch to assist the uh, operation for the Honeydew. And it's hard to overstate the dedication of auto crew to Elizabeth Ronald in the time she seemed to be constantly at sea. Participating in these services during this appalling weather over the days of searching, particularly the younger crew members who were involved in both services, David Murphy, Pat Clody, and Paul Sheehan. The crew of the search for the Honey Jewels recorded as Trophy Murphy, Roy Abrahamson, mechanic and crew members, David Murphy, John Clody, Pat Clody, Paul Sheehan, and Ray Healy. A special note was included, Cox and Murphy, demonstrate remarkable commitment leaving the sick bed to take the lifeboat to see for this service. So that was wonderful uh, service by the Dunmore men. Now the <clears throat> local paper included this the following week I thought it was a very nice piece of writing and I'll read it for you if I may. The stubble trawler sinking has reminded us of the grave dangers facing fishermen as they go about their daily work. Few people would put up with the risks associated with battling storms and raging seas to earn a living, often for very small return due to restrictive catch quotas. It takes special courage and character to be a fisherman. These fishermen, the RNLI lifeboat crews, Coast Guard helicopter rescuers, Garda and Naval Service divers, many volunteers who have given up their free time to scour the coastline or simply provide comforting refreshments and a sympathetic ear, ear to those waiting to show up and use richly deserve our admiration. Their heroism, sacrifice and kindness have been a welcome beacon of light in the midst of the awfulness of the past week. I thought that was a very nice tribute to everybody from that awful week in Dunmore East. And Wexford and Waterford Coast community. There's, on a happier note, a rescue in 2012. I thought you might like to see it because it's um, a beautiful photograph taken by Roy Abram on board the Elizabeth and Ronald. And I see the tow line there. So that's lovely, lovely photograph. And that. Um, year um end of 2012 Jofi Murphy retired he was a coxswain and that was his send off there um rounding the hook with the the Tamer lifeboat from Kil Kilmore Key the Dunmore lifeboat on the inside the smaller one the uh, Trent class and they rounding the hook on what was Jofi's last last time as Cox and there he is bidding bidding farewell to that the hook after his wonderful service to the lifeboat over many years. Remember, we saw him in 1970 uh, with long hair for the um, Dan Malure. That was um, 36 years later. Um, sorry, 33 years later, still giving service to the lifeboat. Now, <clears throat> We move on to 2017 and well, I've given, I've given that away. That photograph, the question was how, how old do you think that photograph is? And hoping somebody might say 100 years old, but on closer examination, you see a stern trawler in the background, so that kind of gives the, the game away. But it, um, the crew is the, the current crew of the Don Maurice Lifeboat. The, process used to take the photograph is a Victorian one. So it's, let's say, 100 years, 100 years old. And these 
photographs of crews, coxswains, mechanics, and life and slipways of stations have been taken by this man here, and that his name is Jack Lowe. And for anybody of my vintage who remembers or still watches reruns of Dad's Army, the famous actor Arthur Lowe, who played Captain Mannering, would be Jack's grandfather. And Jack comes from Newcastle in, the, in England, and this is his mission to visit all the lifeboat stations. And he's been hampered by COVID, but every lifeboat station in the UK and Ireland, and take these wonderful photographs. And then he's, he, he puts them up for sale. And they're beautiful photographs to purchase. And he finances his, his mission from the sale of his photographs and does a, a blog. So he's a, a great, great project. And the next one, I think, is a fabulous photo. And that's <clears throat> Michael Griffin, who was the who, who was coxswain who followed uh, Joe Murphy and was coxswain up to 2019 when Roy Abrahamson took over. So that's it. Uh, and uh, Jack on his website would have a blog about taking that photograph. Now he had to control Michael a little bit, sort of um, relax and so forth. So you can read about that in his visit. It's done more for anybody who goes on his, his website and looks at his wonderful gallery of photographs that he's taken and there's more to come. So that brings us nearly up to, up to date. This is a famous rescue that took place just as our book was going to print. So we had to, it held it up slightly, but it was well worth holding up. because This is a very famous rescue it took place in October 2020. This vessel is the Lily B. It was a German cargo um, ship and it lost power very close to Hook Head. And if it had gone onto the rocks, well, Apart from the possible loss of life, the devastation that could have caused the wildlife and the ecology of the Hook Peninsula would have been just un unimaginable. And just like to 1914, the three lifeboats set out, <coughs> Dunmore set out with Walter Abrahamson, Kilmore with Cox, Eugene Kehoe, and Ross Lair with um, Cox, Eamon O'Rourke all came to the rescue of the Lily B. And the Dunmore and Kilmore lifeboats got tow lines on board. It was quite difficult because the crew were all in the in the bridge and getting up to the uh, Vauxhall was qu quite a, an ordeal in the weather. So inch by inch they pulled the the boat away until such time as a the tug the tramo time could arrive from from water. So it, it it took a while to come obviously, but the lifeboats did their did their business and got an inch by inch got it off, save saved it from going onto the rock. And the three three coxswains are will be rewarded by bronze medals for their this wonderful service. And this is a little bit of footage which you may like to see. Gives you an idea of the condition of the time. Okay, that's um, Roy Abrams, who was a coxswain on the Dunmore lifeboat. He took one of his photographs. He was able to take it while uh, towing the, the lifeboat. You can see the, what the weather was like. 
uh, Joe Malloy, a, a volunteer who, who was ashore, and he took that photograph of Dunmore's. And it just shows you how close the life or the cargo ship came to going on the rock. And again, Liam Ryan from Feathered, who's very generous with his photographs. Liam took that photograph, and again, you can see the onlookers on Hookhead, how close the boat was to being wrecked. And that's what by Liam taken from the shore. And there you have the Dunmore crew. And their names are from le left to right. It's Peter Curran with the spectacles, Neville Murphy with the beard, uh, David Murphy in mechanic in the mechanic, and then Roy in the center, the coxswain, Luca, Sweeney crew member who's only 18, uh, Kevin Dingley, another crew member, and John, John Welsh, um, the, the other crew member. So well done to all of them. And I had the pleasure in August visiting the lifeboat. I was with the presented check, and I had the pleasure of meeting Roy. So I was delighted to meet him because it's nice to meet meet to meet a real a real hero. And he's a, a very nice, modest guy. And I was delighted to meet him. So a few weeks later, he would have brought the new lifeboat to Dunmore. Uh, the new it's called the William and Agnes Ray, the, the Shannon class, the latest, most up-to-date technology imaginable. With no propellers. It's powered by jet jet skis or um, jet foils. Uh, it doesn't have a steering wheel. Uh, the joystick. Uh, it's an, an amazing bit of technology. And uh, Roy brought her into Dunmore on September the 26th. And there was sort of intensive training then as crew to bring them up to a level before uh, they could sign off on the old boat. So on Saturday the 6th of November, that's only a few weeks ago, the old live boat left. And that was a very sad occasion for the village and we look at it in a second. But that's the, the, new, the new boat coming. And Lee Ryan was in Dunmore to capture that as she came into the, the harbour. And this is the old boat going. It's always sad for a, a lifeboat station to see a boat that served so well over so many years. So here we see it depart on the 6th of November. Leaving to go to New Ross, um, to have all the electrics overhauled before it goes into the lake fleet. It's kind of heading up over the harbour towards New Ross. Normally, life would go around the hope maybe on the way to <coughs> pool there. Um, wherever <coughs> this, she left going up the river at 3 pm on the 6th of November. <coughs> End of an era, very sad occasion. But happy part is the new, the new life boat arrived, and um, it came on the 26th of September. And it was a huge occasion for the village. You can see the crowds of people that turned out, and RTE were there to record it. And we'll take a look at what Pascal Sheehy said on the day, and you'll hear Roy speaking and Neville, who were interviewed. Dunmore East has had its own lifeboat station since 1884. At 1341 this afternoon, matching its unique number within the RNLI, the Shannon class William and Agnes Ray was led into the harbour in Dunmore East by the lifeboat it's replacing, the Trent class Elizabeth and Ronald. It was flanked by other lifeboats from the area and overseen by the Coast Guard helicopter Rescue 117. Proud day for me, for my family, for, for all these lads here. 
uh, the whole community. You can see the turnout here. It really shows what these boats do mean, you know. The William and Agnes Ray cost almost two and a half million euro to build. It will need all the power, agility and manoeuvrability it's equipped with. The Dunmore East lifeboat has been launched more than 150 times over the past decade, including to this successful rescue of the cargo vessel Lily B and its crew of nine, which had lost power and was drifting towards rocks at Hookhead in County Wexford. They were extreme conditions on the day, so you know to have a, a boat of the quality of the Agnes, William and Agnes Ray here now, you know it will certainly make our job easier and it will certainly make our job safer. Training of the crew on board the William and Agnes Ray will continue for several weeks before the new lifeboat officially enters service. Pascal Sheehy, RTE News, Dunmore East, County Waterford. OK, we've nearly uh, come to the end. Of, I know it's a very brief. We only looked at a very small number of rescues. Um, there's been over a thousand shouts in the history of the Dunmore East lifeboat. So, I mean, that would be a thousand slides. <laughs> And there was just one thing I forgot to mention uh, was that all the, the book was produced because of the kindness of so many people in Dunmore East, in County Wexford and in County Waterford, who small businesses and companies and hotels, pubs, who very generously donated to the book and were able to produce such a good book. And it met all the costs of the book so that when every copy was sold and went directly to the RNLI, there was no overheads. And we're very grateful to them, very grateful to them. Bill Levy, who did such a wonderful job printing the book, and who also gave us the idea to uh, uh, go down that route. We, we had been looking at kind of maybe a heritage project, uh, but we did, Bill encouraged us to do it as a fundraiser, and we're delighted that we did. It was a very enjoyable and well worth experience. So thanks to a lot of people, and thank you for watching tonight. And this is a little treat for you now, because it's an hour and a light talk. We're going to finish with the, uh, the lifeboat anthem, which I think you'll like. It's, Liam Clancy singing Home from the Sea and Ian Dunn of Don Maurice has put a bit of video footage with it. He's taken <clears throat> clips from various rescues and practice runs and so forth and it matches the music and I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. So have a listen to this. On a cold winter's night, with a storm at its height, a lifeboat answered the call. They pitched and they tossed till we thought they were lost as we watched from the harbor wall. Though the night was pitch black, there was no turning back. Someone was waiting out there But each volunteer had to live with his fear As they joined in a silent prayer Carry us home, all home from the sea Angels of mercy, answer our plea Home, home, home from the sea Carry us safely home from the sea As they battle their way Past the mouth of the bay It was blowing like Never before As they gallantly fought Every one of them thought Of loved ones back on the shore Then a flicker of light And they knew they were right There she was on the crest of a wave She's an old fishing boat And she's barely afloat Please, God, there are souls we can save. 
and carry them home, home, home from the sea. Angels of mercy answer our plea and carry us home, home, home from the sea. Carry us safely home from the sea. Back in the town, in a street that runs down to the sea and the harbour wall, they had gathered in pairs at the foot of the stairs to wait for the radio call. And just before dawn, when all hope was gone, came a hush. And a far away sound. Twas the coxswain he roared. All survivors on board, thank God, and we're homeward bound to carry them home, home, home from the sea. Angels of mercy, answer our plea. That was a, a tremendous lecture tonight, I must say. Uh, yeah, a big thank lecture you, befitting a, a very big <laughs> subject. Uh, yeah. Wonderfully researched, wonderfully illustrated, and very finely delivered indeed. And thank, I'm, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure I speak for everybody here when I say thank you on behalf of the Dublin Bay All Gaffers Association. And I know I speak, I must speak on behalf of the lifeboat. You're an ally as well uh, to say thank you for all of your efforts in uh, raising funds and in writing a wonderful book and in giving us this fantastic lecture tonight. So thank you very much. It was an absolute pleasure, um, Cormac. So thank you. Thank you for inv inviting me. I look forward to many more talks. That was a fabulous talk. Thanks, David. And I have Thanks, very Rob. fond memories of my, my teenage years collecting for the lifeboat every year. Yeah. We teenagers had competition to see who could collect the most. <laughs> and it was a sign of how much the lifeboat was favoured amongst Dunmore that we all collected a huge amount of money, which suggested that everybody was being asked again and again and again <laughs> and paying again and again and again. But my question um just um, between Councillor Strand and Law Vich on Cathedral Rocks, mm. there I remember seeing machinery there from presumably a wreck. And I wonder if you know what that was from. And yeah. my second question is that the book is out of stock according to your website. Is it going to be back in stock at all? Um, not really. It was kind of a, a one-off. Um, we printed a little more than we thought we needed because it's not a book that lends itself to a second edition because you'd have to finance it from scratch. But there is copies available in the station in Dunmore East. And I know the Waterford Book Centre still has a number. They, they have it online. So, I mean, I'll uh, I'll make sure if you want a copy, we'll get one. Yeah, I'll, for I'll, you and I'll check the Book Centre website. Thanks for that, Jim. Yeah, but we'll get you one from Dunmore. Don't worry, because... We know, we know, we know, we know who you are. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the 
my my guess on the the, the rocks. Now, this is a, a guess, and maybe um, I don't know if Brendan Dunn is li listening. Um, was but I think that could be the um, barge that went up in 1960. Okay, that's a, a guess that went uh, around that area. There was two. Captain Owens, he was the harbour master of New Ross. He was bringing, I think, Guinnesses had got offloaded all their barges, and two must have been towed around from the Shannon around, I reckon. I remember they came into Dunmore, and the idea was sort of to go up the um, up the barrow, and he set off motoring or one with the engine, and he was towing the other one in very bad conditions. And P Paddy Billy Power was looking out, and he knew that there was going to be trouble and he, I think the lifeboat set out and got it to the nick of time and he was uh, rescued. And that was, um, but one one um, barge went up in the rocks and was wrecked. And the other one, um, because it was so, so heavy, it didn't sort of um, drift away. <laughs> and that was towed back in. And that was 1960. Yeah, that, um, that a figure, John, thanks for that. I first yeah, saw John, it about 1961, I think it was. Yeah, so it would have been shortly after that. Thanks well, very much for sorry, that. Yeah, again, sorry to go on, but um, John Roach, you probably remember a fisherman, he had a trawler that drifted across the bay like his, um, and went up in the rocks to May 2 around that same area. So it could be that one. don't know whether the John Buck and anything was ever, it got smashed to pieces. But somebody locally in Dunmore would... We have some more information and we'll pass it on to you. Yeah, I'm over in England and uh, I've been, I attended a, one of two talks when I've been on holiday with my family. And that was it. Really, really interesting. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. PCH. Well, if I might just add, uh, David has been the recipient of a very fine plaque uh, oh. recently. And thanks from the RNLI. Uh, yes. Perhaps he might show it to us if he has it to hand. Uh, very, very a very small reward for a very big effort, but very befitting, nevertheless. David, how yeah. long did it take to research the book? R roughly two years, but uh, it wasn't a very intensive two years. It was, I mean, the middle of summer, I absolutely took a full break to go and sort of watch yeah, lots of cricket matches, so I wasn't doing any writing. It was in fits and starts. I tried to get, get hold of as many life old books as I could initially to see how other people had gone gone about it. And then I, I started writing about the, the feathered life book because that was the, what I'd originally set out to start writing. So that piece of the book got written first and then I, I went backwards <laughs> mm -hmm. and forwards. Uh, so it was written in bits and pieces and researched. And I'm not a very disciplined person, so there wasn't any great sort of getting up early every morning and um, spending so many hours. It was, but uh, we got we got there eventually. And I mean, I got, got wonderful support from Dunmore. Mm. I would have spoken almost every day to Brendan Dunn, emails. And he checked out everything. Wonderful, the, the support I got. And then the, the book committee were really good because they, they read through drafts and so forth look for all the, the orders and look for all the sponsorship and without without them like we wouldn't the book wouldn't have wouldn't have happened. Are there are there any lifeboat stations that that still need a history written of them? My sort of at the time nearly every lifeboat station Arklow done well John the Corsi Ireland did uh Dun Leary um Arklow was done Jim Reese, John Power did Kilmore, Yall there's a man, I can't think of his name, Belly Cotton. Yeah, the, um, Valencia, there was one. So every, Dunmore was one, if you like, the, the, the later ones that come, yeah. come to the table. Now, there had been a, fun, a, a small booklet out, as we mentioned, the, the story of Dunmore East Lifeboats by Jeff Morris, but um, it didn't give you any information on the actual people involved or the, the village itself, or it was just purely... Uh, a record of services carried out. No, a good little book, nevertheless. Our one tried to cover a lot more. Thank you. It might interest you to know that uh, it's not 
not particularly to do with the lifeboat, but um, the uh, the Milford trawler that you showed us earlier on, that actually broke up and slid into slightly deeper water. And I dived on the remains mm. of it. There's quite a good bit of it left back in the 1980s. Mm. It's the height of my diving career. <laughs> and I, I actually dived on it several times down at the hook. It was quite a popular dive one time. I suspect there's not quite as much of it there now. Yeah, I see there in chat, uh, Rose Michael is saying that the Maritime Museum has some copies of the book. Funny, I sh- should have mentioned that because I was there recently. I, I saw them in the as you walk in, as you go in at the reception. Well, has anybody any more questions to ask? Hi, David. It's lovely to see you again. Um, Hi, we'll have to stop meeting like this. <laughs> I brought David's plaque round to him yeah. for cover of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because I was warned that he ha- had to get it and a, and a lovely letter by our chief executive yeah. who wrote the foreword as well. Um, David, I was really curious, the GAA medals, if you don't mind me asking, um, with the feather, because, you yeah. know, we've been in a partnership. By the way, sorry, I work for the Ornall, I am Neve Stevenson, yeah. but um, we were in, a, we're in a partnership with the GAA since yeah. 2017 which is about safety and water safety. And actually there is a group coming over to the college next week, um, a couple of players and a couple of senior GAA people. I would love to mention this. Um, I was kind of half aware of it, but I've never really been able to get more information. Yeah. You, you know how that came about? Why just two medals were given? Because also I know Ross Slayer, St. Mary's GAA club, have on their crest a lifeboat. Um, mm. Tony Kyo, I think, told me that from Ross Lair, and it's incredible. It's there, you can see it. But do, do you know anything more about how that happened? No, I, I reckon, this is a guess, but I reckon those two, uh, Bill, Bill Dogan and um, Jim Wickham, were probably members of the GAA. Ned was the cox, and he was probably a good bit older, but they were probably, at, you know, probably active members. Or, uh, but There'll be lots of people who will be able to help you. I mean, I'll get on. I'll get on to it. Like uh, Brandon Power in Feather, or Liam Ryan, uh, Brian Clear, and um, I'm sure we'll, we'll get get more information for you in the next day or two. But it, it's I have um, Liam R- Ryan's book, and it's it's mentioned in it, so I'll scan in the page for you, and we'll get get you a bit more information. Yeah, you can see in, in that photograph, you can see they have chains on their waistcoats, and I think that's the GAA medals. Lovely. I must share a picture of that actually during the talk. That's kind of a little gem we can take. That, I, rob, I kind of robbed that from from whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah I asked the RNLI for permission, and they said it's kind of had nothing to do with them or something. So I, <laughs> it's just took it anyway. Mm-hmm. But it, it's, a, um, it's a great photograph. All the, the Irish guys are at one side of the one side of the yeah. <laughs> Still the same. That's um, it, David. Thanks a million, and thanks so much for the talk. Great talk. Uh, okay, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Well, thanks, Steve. Okay, bye, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. That was great. Yeah, I, thanks, David. Okay, bye, bye.